Yeah. There we go. Good. Good. Okay. Go ahead, Shabu. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste, assalamu alaikum. Good evening or good morning to you all, depending on the time zone in which you live and in which you are joining us from. We are pleased to have people in this meeting from different time zones and from all different parts of the world. I am Shobi Ali, an Indo-Guyanese living in London since I was a child. I have studied Caribbean history, culture, and indentureship for my degree. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 165th edition of our Zoom public meeting. We wish to sincerely thank all of you who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian Diaspora Global Project. For 164 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday. In the past three years, five months and one week, we have featured an impressive 714 presenters from all different parts of the world, speaking on 164 topics. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Centre, a legally registered research and publishing company, which has been operating since 2010. And like today, we often partner with the Amina Gafour Institute for the study of indentureship and its legacies, which is led by Professor David Dabadine. In order to continue this weekly program and to make it better and bigger, we are asking for your suggestions, volunteers, as well as your donations. Please contact Dr. Mahabir for details on this. We wish to congratulate Professor David Dabadin and the Amina Gafour Institute for taking the lead in establishing a visiting fellowship in indentureship studies at the University of Cambridge. This is the first of its kind in the world. Last Thursday, Professor Guy Chaw Badahur, author of the book entitled Cully Woman, gave an address at Selwyn College in Cambridge where she was appointed the first visiting bifellow in indentureship studies. Professor Dabidin also gave a short talk. I and Dr. Kumar Mahabir and Shalima Mohammed attended this historic event at the University of Cambridge in England, and it was very enjoyable. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator this evening tonight is again Shalima Mohammed, the co-director of this Zoom platform. She is a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. She obtained her master's degree in business psychology from Franklin University in the USA. Thank you, Shal Shalima, welcome and please take over from here. Thank you so much, Shob. Glad to have you chair again today. Assalamu alaikum everyone, namaste and a very warm welcome to all of you. I wanna say thank you for choosing to be here with us. This public meeting will take the form of a film screening and panel discussion, followed by Q&A. This meeting is being recorded live and would be uploaded later on YouTube permanently for posterity. We are also live streaming on the YouTube channel of the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center. So I wanna say hi to all of you all on YouTube. To avoid intrusions from trolls, Ravan Ramsing, our IT manager has muted everyone. I'll ask our speakers, please do not admit anyone, do not unmute anyone, and please don't allow anyone to share your screen. Thank you so much. Over the next two hours or so, we'll be viewing and discussing the BBC documentary film entitled, Coolies, How Britain Reinvented Slavery. This is a compelling and thought-provoking documentary film produced by BBC in London. This eye-opening production delves into a chapter of history that has often been overlooked, that of Asian Indian indentured laborers, known as coolies, during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Through meticulous research, powerful storytelling, and poignant interviews with historians and descendants of coolies, the documentary sheds light on the harsh realities of this system of labor, which some termed a new form of slavery. 
It, vid it vividly portrays the immense suffering and deplorable working conditions these Asian Indians endured while toiling on British colonial plantations, railways, and other labor intensive projects across the globe. I'll ask Robin to show that now. This should be about one hour long, after which we will take questions. And we will have our discussants, Professor David Abney. In the early 19th century, Britain was the most powerful nation on earth. Her colonies stretched from the Caribbean to the South Pacific. This was the largest empire the world had ever seen. But there is a lost chapter to that imperial history. The story of over a million people who were secretly enslaved and transported to the farthest shores of the British Empire. Shipped under agreements that they could neither read nor understand, they didn't know where they were going, and most of them never made it home. Yet what was one of the largest movements of people in the 19th century has now been almost completely forgotten. A story which implicates those at the very highest level of successive British governments. Indentured emigration is one of the most remarkable episodes in modern history. The systematic recruitment and migration of over one million people to all the corners of the globe. Indians are one of the most dispersed groups on this planet. And have you ever stopped to think why Indians are found in these far-flung places? For hundreds of thousands of men, women and children, this was not just a voyage into the unknown. It was a life sentence. When you take the system of coercion, the system of the lack of justice, the meagerness of people's existence, and the fact that they were just there to work to make money for the, for the planter class, then you can see why indentureship was called a new system of slavery. By the 1830s, Britain's empire was growing at a phenomenal rate. Crops such as tea, coffee, cotton and sugar had become staple products for an increasingly prosperous population. But the new and hungry machinery required an endless supply of raw material, and the furnaces of progress were fueled by slave labour. And while the empire was reaching its peak, it was also facing its greatest crisis. Liberals were demanding reform of the slave trade, beginning the process that would lead to the abolition of slavery. Of justice, humanity and sound policy. It is In less than five years, Britain's plantation owners would lose their African slaves forever. The British liked to preen themselves on the morality of this decision that between 1833 and 1838 they end a system that they had in fact perfected and that had seen the shipping of millions of Africans across the Atlantic. For all kinds of complicated reasons the British turned their back on that in the 1830s, mainly economic, partly theological, partly political, but they turned their back on it. They decide they don't need it. But that leaves them with a problem because the great economic system that they put in place on the back of slavery, and that is sugar, primarily sugar, though other commodities as well, had to be produced by someone. Indians seem to fit the bill. India might actually be a kind of replacement for Africa. India and Indians might actually provide an answer to the labor void that had opened up in the old slave corners. Whitehall's answer came in 1836. Publicly committed to spending millions dismantling the slave trade, the government secretly colluded in the creation of a new system of slavery. It was called indentured labor. Indentured labour is a man or woman putting the mark on a document, a legal document, signing away their freedom to a particular employer 
for the duration specified by the indenture, five, seven, ten years, whatever, you're no longer a free man. To trade in human lives so soon after the abolition of slavery required high-level contacts. But the man behind the plan was John Gladstone, a former member of parliament and father of the future British Prime Minister. He began by writing to one of his former colleagues in the slave trade. You will probably be aware that we are very particularly situated with our Negro apprentices in the West Indies and that it is a matter of doubt and uncertainty how far they may be induced to continue their services on the plantations after their apprenticeship expires in 1840. In May 1836, Gladstone received the reply he was hoping for. Dear Mr. Gladstone, we thank you for your inquiry. Within the last two years, upwards of 2,000 natives have been sent from this to the Mauritius. The Dangas are always spoken of as more akin to the monkey than the man. They have no religion, no education, and in their present state no wants beyond eating, drinking and sleeping, and to procure which they're willing to labour. We're not aware that any greater difficulty would present itself in sending men to the West Indies, the natives being perfectly ignorant of the place they agree to go to and the length of voyage they're undertaking. Gladstone was delighted, and a deal was struck. The first ships left the port of Calcutta in April 1838, carrying a human cargo of some 400 Indians. They were called the Gladstone Coolies, after the Anglo-Indian word for manual labourer. These coolies would be making the longest journey of their lives, a voyage that would end on the sugar plantations of South America. In Gladstone's day, the remote colony of British Guyana produced the best sugar in the world, and the coastal plantations there had become a household name. Demerara. My name is David Dapper Eden. Even though the name means very little to me, I know very little about the name. I teach literature at a university in Britain, the University of Warwick, and I've come to Guyana to look for the origins of my great-great-grandfather, who came from India in the 19th century, one of hundreds of thousands of people who went overseas to cut cane in the plantations. He's been totally lost in history, and I just want to discover something about this bareback, barefooted coolie who stepped off the planks, stepped off the Englishman's boat, and ended up on these shores. I've been told that in our national archives, there are various lists of Indians in the plantation, birth certificates, etc. So I will just go through those as um, diligently as I can to try to trace this man. It'll be a needle in a haystack job, I suspect. I was looking for the first Abney who came in 1855, yep. and I don't know, I don't know the date, you see. So I was hoping to find the date. I know the name of the ship. My mother told me it was the Apolline. If I look at June 1855, would it be later than June 1855? Uh, you don't think this, this would be it? No, our registers would have the details, but our ship records don't go back to 55. Where um, are the records? Do they exist? No, uh, um, I don't think so. My best bet is at the PRO though. In, in London? Yes. No. And then there are scattered, um, you know, in various offices as well. So that even if the records did exist, we wouldn't really necessarily know what location in Guyana, yeah, exactly. or indeed in England, they exist. Or even in villages throughout India, the British kept meticulous records as the Indians were recruited, gathered into holding depots, and registered. They would have been, in all likelihood, ordinary peasant Indians. They would never, ever, ever have come across the sophistication of the British Empire the bureaucratic sophistication of it until they went to the depot to be certified as fit and healthy emigrants and to be, um, to be validated by the British as potential emigrants. 
certified that we have examined and passed the above-named woman as fit to emigrate, that she is free from all bodily and mental disease, and that she has been vaccinated since engaging to emigrate. There must have been a great moment of drama when they were asked to sign this piece of paper and, and having to press their thumb into the ink and, and, and press it on this piece of paper. Their first contact with paper probably. There must have been some kind of excitement perhaps, despair, but at least somebody's paying attention to them to take their finger and press it on a piece of paper. They would not have understood what pressing, of, pressing their thumbs on a piece of paper meant because um, they wouldn't have known that that was the equivalent of a signature. This piece of paper is all that remains of the life of this woman. And she's won, there's hundreds in this book, band book, hundreds, men, women, children. And this volume is one volume among 358, I believe, in this building alone. So you get a sense of how many Indians came we know that about 239,000 people came from India to Guyana alone, never mind to Jamaica, to Barbados, the rest of the West Indies. For a long time, the history of indenture was seen as the site of embarrassing history. People were reluctant to confront the truth of their past. Historian Bridge Lal is also investigating his family's past. My grandfather was an indentured laborer. He came from the district of Bahiraj. He was in his early 20s. And he told me that, you know, he was roaming around in the village and one day a man took him aside and said would you like to earn some money and my grandfather a young man without employment said yes and he took him to a, to a depot and there my grandfather encountered other men and some women who were also recruited by the same Arkati recruiter and there he learned about going overseas and you'd become a wealthy man. From this tiny depot in the village, he and, and other people who had been recruited were taken to Lucknow. And from there, they're taken to a larger depot in a district called Faisabad. And from there, he, he went to um, Calcutta. <laughs> Like all of these people, he had no idea precisely where he was going. Uh, it was a tapu, an island, but that was about all that he knew. So he said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go to this tapu, and, and it's not too far away, and I'll come back after, after five years or ten years. He didn't intend to leave his homeland for good. It was a traumatic experience to live in this confined you know, spaces on the ships with people who spoke dialects they did not understand, people from different castes, religions, social background. And this terrible long voyage, the traumatic three month journey across the dark seas, the Kalapani, traumatized the people, many of whom had never seen water before. Mortality aboard the coolie ships was appalling. During the voyage of one, the Sol set, the captain's log recorded that over a third of the Indians died en route. March 26th, a little orphan girl, four years of age, died in a state of great emotion. Three coolies died. A man, a fine girl, 18, who attended the little orphan boy. A little boy of 12, 27. A fine little baby has died. This mortality is dreadful and without any means of being checked. 
a great reformation is required in the system of coolie emigration. May 2nd, one of the twins. By 1840, over 20,000 Indians had made the long ocean crossing to South America. After a voyage of three months and some nine and a half thousand miles, the Indians finally landed in Demerara. This is where they arrived. They'll face this way and they're stepping ashore, so all this would have been land, it would have been fairly um, wild land, wouldn't it? Forests and... Man, you know, swamp. But still the excitement of landing. But you know, they, they would have stepped back to have one last look. And when you look, you see nothing. The ocean just stretches endlessly. You can't see India. Whatever the hazards of the journey, it must have been a moment of great excitement. Um, these simple peasants, some of whom might have never seen um, water before, landing here, landing on a new continent. Curious spectators would have gathered to see these coolies, the first Indian coolies from uh, the subcontinent. They would have been numbered in batches and properly regimented. They were deloused, they were made presentable for the inspection of the planters. Upstairs, they met labor officers, and downstairs, they met the immigration officers. So they came, they were cleaned up, they were given a bath, they were registered, they were contracted formally. Having survived the long ocean voyage, their ordeal was only just beginning. These Indians didn't know it, but they would replace the African slaves that Britain had so recently lost. The vast majority would never see India again, and would end their lives working in cane fields on the other side of the world. Slavery had been renamed and reinvented. It's an extraordinary phenomenon that you're shipping people out of Calcutta and shipping them all the way to the Americas to produce a commodity, sugar, which the West and anyone could do without perfectly well, but which, uh, in fact, people become completely addicted to. It's this great driving force of sugar and sweet taste in the Western world, which needs labor of some kind, slave labor, indentured labor, whatever, to produce it. Whitehall, 1840. And Gladstone's experiment in South America began to be questioned as reports of appalling mortality on the plantations filtered back to London. The transportation of Indians was debated in Parliament, forcing the Foreign Secretary, Lord John Russell, to make his doubts public. I am not prepared to encounter the responsibility of a measure which may lead to a dreadful loss of life on the one hand or on the other to a new system of slavery. But the influence of the planters on Parliament was too strong. Lord John Russell found himself outvoted and the floodgates were opened. Over the next 80 years, Indians would be transported to every corner of the empire. Planters had always had, throughout the 18th century, a powerful political hold in Westminster. The Caribbean was the, became the great jewel in the British um, crown. I mean, this was the, the great centre of British wealth. I mean, India too, of course, but in terms of political power in London, planters, the plantocracy, the West India lobby, that represented both planters and West India merchants and shippers, they could bend the ear of politicians and statesmen. It's in the planters' interest to continue indenture because they need the labor. Think of this from the planters point of view. They live in their own particular culture where they need outside labor. First of all Africans, later indentured Indian labor. They're trapped by this system as much as other people. They can't imagine a world that would deny them a source of labor, cheap malleable labor. Their whole economic enterprise would collapse without it. So the planters need to continue in the 19th century 
indentured labour, much as in the 18th century, they couldn't have ever have imagined life without the slaves. India was now the empire's main source of cheap, expendable labour, and sugar production had spread to every corner of the globe. In 1874, the Fiji Islands became a crown colony. The planters turned to India to supply the manpower, and soon ships loaded with Indians began the long voyage to the South Pacific. This is Fiji, picturesque and prosperous, contented and industrious. Tropical islands with a fascinating mixture of the old and the new. An outpost of empire at the crossroads of the Pacific. When people think of Fiji, I suppose they think of a tropical paradise. But a paradise haunted by a terrible past. This is where our history begins. My grandfather came as an indentured laborer to this place and this is where he served his indenture. So for about three generations, sugar has been in our blood. Bridge Lal is visiting the family home in Fiji. This is my place. This is the place of my childhood. We didn't have structures like this. We had thatched houses. And in fact, it was in a thatched hut right here uh, that I was born. This is where my grandfather's journey ended. I remember him telling me that the most difficult thing for him in the early, early days was getting used to living in congested lines and having as his companions people from different parts of India different social backgrounds, different customs, different rituals and ceremonies and sometimes even speaking different dialects. The coolies lived in tin shacks. They were called lines and built in long rows beside the plantation. A single room, 10 feet by 12 feet, housed three single men or one man and his entire family. Diseases including cholera, malaria and typhoid regularly wiped out hundreds of Indians at a time. Bridge is going to meet one of a handful of survivors. Ram Ram. Ram Ram. Ram Ram. Din mein kaam karo, sanjha ka pa nao dho, manao khao, suto, tine vajay raas se, utho, 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 ghoda, kya stabil mein garaas, jewal aadmi, utho, sabayar ho jaya, lana fil mein jaya, fil khao kari ke, manao khao, to utho aadmi chat pat, chat pat, manao hai khaye, utna sabayar hai bhoog khao lagay, roti baan le, le jaya hai khaye, hit mein. The Indians move into the old cabins, the old living places of uh, the former slaves, or they're provided with similar, in a similar location. I mean, one particular plantation that I know in the middle of Jamaica, to this day, has on the edge of its sugar fields an area called India, and it's where they located the first uh, Indian indentured laborers. Conditions worldwide were as poor as they had been in the slave days. In Guyana, David Dabadine has managed to trace the very last surviving witness. I'm going to see somebody who I've been told was born into that condition of servitude, was born into indentorship. An elderly lady, I think she's now in her 90s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. How are you? Yes, You were born in India? Me born in India and grow Guyana. 
three year old me company three yeah. uh-huh. three year old me never been done three year but your, your father worked in uh, cutting cane yes me father me never cut cane Diana me and I'll be never going to live for no bread doing what working in cane field cane field here now nah. we roll the trash and put them on the bank you roll the trash and put them on the bank and you take a hole and you dig a dot and the blank the man and take them and you wrap them and you go to the pond me go to the yard me go to the house to do what you go see now what take place in there oh you could just go in go in as a child i have a child Ah, what do you see? What do you see? Well, me only see the white man you knock three get away back to your house. <laughs> so you look at white man, you peep, and then you go back home. Come back to your place. Ah, what, what white man doing when you peep? What, what, what was he doing? Nah, he nah, do not me. As Indian men, women, and children toiled in the fields, their colonial masters lived in the very height of luxury. It is the closest to paradise that you can get to be a planter. I mean, as a Hindu, I hope I come back as a 19th century planter. You lived in terrific affluence. You lived in a big white house, sometimes on a level above the cane field. So you can sit in your veranda and sip your lemonade and be fanned by your servant and have your toenails cut at the same time by some kuli and you could watch at your laborers working. You know, you could sleep with any woman you wanted to, more or less. Yes. Um, everything was done for you, from the time you woke up to the time you went to bed. Uh, people looked after you, people obeyed you, people were afraid of you. Your single word as a plantation owner um, could deny life. The men that had once cracked the whip over the slave gangs heading for the slave fields now do much the same over Indian indentured labour, heading to do precisely the same work in the same fields, at the same regime, producing the same commodities for the same markets. This is an overseer's house, a Columbus house, and it, as you can see, it is situated on a hill. And for a very good reason, because the overseer would get a very good view of, of the fields under his, under his charge. And here he would, the overseer would stand and survey the field and get a good view of the work that was being done. So he was in, in a commanding position, both literally as well as metaphorically. He would think for them, he was a seer, he was wise on their behalf. They just had to cut the cane and obey him. So that term overseer, which is a very paternalistic and patronizing term, was still kept for the, in the days of indentureship. But worst of all was the term driver. Do you know how that term is pregnant with terror? The, the memory of terror? Because really what it meant in the days of slavery is that you were driven with a whip. You were driven to work. And many of them viewed the, the laborers not as human beings but as but as, as as units of work to be to be exploited we know that in the 19th century planters would shoot people beat them shoot them and nobody would arrest them you know so you're in a position of utter power and authority but the worst of all was the arrogance you would have you know you you would know that you were supreme of a supreme civilization you were high up the food chain <laughs> you ate first and you ate best and so therefore uh, you were you were you were you were elevated in all ways above the coolies and your authority and your arrogance depended on their their um, scrubbing and, and, and grubbing in, in, in the cane field me here said white man I shoot I know go this I I know go that say so me be like to no friend me get there can I can I a peep around, watch around, 
put the time. So you hide. If you hear white man shooting there, you, you hide. Hide. You hide. So I'm just getting a bee from my house and, and then you know, the clock. You just make one chain, push past and you from make one part lock, push past and the door. Yeah. So the, I'm just peek by the hole. वो लोग ये गिरमेट कमाए हैं बहुत दुख तकलीफ काटे के पड़ा अरे हम गोरा लोग लाश से मारे इसे अच्छा गोरा लोग लाश से मारे काम नहीं करो चाबुक लगाए गाड़ी पर हाँ कोई सुनवाई नहीं गिरमेट तुम्हारे गिरमेट तुम्हारे The Indians were officially citizens of the empire, but even in cases of violent abuse, the legal system was stacked against them. In practice, it was extremely difficult. For an indentured labourer to succeed in a case against his or her employer, partly because the courthouses were far away, and the regulations provided that you could not leave your plantations without the permission of the manager, you could be punished, you could be fined, your contracts extended. But even when you went went to court, evidence, written evidence, was always. On the side of the employer, I mean, you get a sense of how terrible the situation was. In 1906, for example, 62 percent of all babies died, made worse by the fact that the system blamed the mothers. Because overseer said, the government said that these Indian women lacked motherly instincts. It was not the lack of motherly instincts; it was the relentless pace of work on plantations, the insanitary conditions where these people lived. It was the system itself that was responsible. And six of them dead. Six of them dead. Big, big one. Belly walk, belly walk, belly walk, belly walk, belly walk. Belly walk make me work. Me, me, me don't know what we got to do. We do too much remedy for them. One, we give one kind of sick a food. When he has to make it there. Me walk. Me and me old man walk from this dam. We get till at wall. And I've got to that box to get one remedy, one bush medicine, to bring up my time for them. The one green that God give me and it can. So everybody dead out, and you left. Me left. Me don't know what me go face it. Me don't know what me go pass through it. The me have to thank God, me beg God night and day. The God where you send me in this world, me no know mother, me no know father. Me grow with them very well, but me no go goodness for them. And you take them for me, and now me no know what me they go turn to be. Too much thing me pass. More than a hundred and fifty years have passed since the export of the Indians began. Many of the records have been lost or destroyed, and David's time is running out. His last chance to trace his great grandfather is at the old post office, where a neglected pile of volumes lie exposed to the elements. I believe that people don't want to remember the past. It's a past of shame. It's not something they want to preserve in a way that in England you would preserve castles and Arthurian legends. I just wish we could have a greater care for these ancient materials and have a greater sense of their value. You know, not just their commercial value. Obviously, they have no commercial value. The coolies used to have commercial value, but their records, the records of their presence, are obviously worthless. I just wish we had a little bit more care and consideration. The ancient documents. I don't think it takes too much money to actually put these things, take take them away from the window and the breeze and the cockroaches, and just lock them up in a vault somewhere. Well, it's a scrap. It might be somebody was born, somebody was died, but whatever it is, they're lying on the floor. 
It just tells you about the difficulty of keeping records in a tropical country. This looks as if it's some of the Demerara. There's no name, 31st of March, Aloma 451. I mean, look at all those scraps over there. Somebody's blown in my direction. Somebody called Trevor Michael has just blown in through the window. So this is Trevor Michael. Shaped like India, in fact. Under the system of indenture, Indians had been transported to every part of the empire. South America, Mauritius, Ceylon, Burma, Malaya, and the South Pacific. But the system was about to face its greatest challenge as a new part of the world began importing Indians by the shipload. Africa, the dark continent. Years ago, fierce wars were waged and the prisoners that were taken were used as slaves. After the coming of the white men, slavery was abolished and slave trails were replaced by iron rails. The Indian coolies were no longer confined to the sugar plantations. In South Africa, the growing railway network required cheap manual labor to continue blazing its trail across the African plains. The train, crawling across the vast African countryside, looks like a tiny insect. By the dawn of the 20th century, over 100,000 Indians were working for the British in Africa, on the railways and in the cane fields and the mines. But the status of Indians within the empire was about to change. In 1893, a young Indian lawyer arrived in Durban and set up his first legal practice. Over the next 20 years, this young man would change drastically from a middle-class lawyer to an extraordinary political leader. His name was Gandhi. Gandhi got to know about indentured laborers very soon after arriving here. His first major contact with an indentured worker was in 1894. The man was beaten by his employer and had his front two teeth smashed and uh, the man was in terrible distress and came into Gandhi's legal offices. This encounter would mark a turning point in the young lawyer's life. Gandhi began his campaign against indentured labor by exposing the plight of the Indians at public meetings. But he quickly realized that the future lay in unifying the isolated Indian community. The result was the first Indian newspaper in Africa. Indian opinion begins to chronicle the conditions that indentured workers lived under and the poor housing conditions, the poor food that they had, the treatment by employers. It, it is a rich chronicle of grievances. Gandhi's newspaper exposed the realities of indentured labor worldwide, but the written word was not his only weapon. It was meant that this paper would reach British India, it would reach authorities in England, that it changed to become a paper of mobilizing people. It begins to take a very important role in motivating people to go to jail. So it becomes a paper which says jail is an honorable place to be when the laws are unjust. The method Gandhi pioneered to end indentured labor became known as passive resistance. A sustained campaign of non-violent protest based on the principle of civil disobedience. It was the first time this technique had ever been used and it would bring the young lawyer into direct conflict with the British legal system. Gandhi and many of his followers ended up serving jail sentences at the prison fort in Johannesburg. His first imprisonment occurs in January 1908 and Gandhi realizes that in order to seek change one needs to go into prison to protest these laws and by one's imprisonment to make the grievance come to the attention of the authorities and to secure its removal. If you think of the people who are coming to jail, the majority of them were traders and hawkers and 
many of them were fairly respectable middle class traders come from you know comfortable uh, lifestyles mm. and to suffer humiliation in the prisons is very difficult for a lot of them. Johannesburg, 1908. The struggle to end indentured labor was building into a national crisis. Indian merchants, laborers and their families willingly went to prison in an effort to bring the system down. Within months, Gandhi and his followers had filled the jails of South Africa to capacity. Over the next five years, Gandhi would be imprisoned on four separate occasions. But going to jail was only the beginning of Gandhi's revolutionary strategy. Even from his prison cell, he used his newspaper to keep up pressure on the authorities. I shall have no opportunity of writing for Indian opinion, as I shall be serving a sentence of imprisonment. The hardships of jail life are mostly imaginary. Keep absolutely firm to the end. Suffering is our only remedy. Victory is certain. It would be another five years before Gandhi's campaign to end indentured labor would reach its climax. Five years of repeated beatings and imprisonments. But Gandhi did not persevere alone. His wife and children, including Uma's grandfather, aged just 18, served prison sentences by his side. So they said second cell? That one. That one. think of an 18 year old boy who wants to go to London to study to be a lawyer <laughs> and who ends up sitting in jail. But I mean he did it willingly and he was happy to do it and he went again and over and over again. Yeah, I think it's just a shock to see the solitary cells. The history of the Gandhi family's struggle in South Africa is well documented. But in South America, David Dabberdeen has yet to find a single reference to his indentured great-grandfather. Coming from Calcutta, starting with the Lord Hungerford, 1845. Right? And here you have the index, and you're looking for the Apolline. You have the Apolline here, because this paper's been around since 1845. You say, when I turn the page in a minute, I'm going to find this old man? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Page 215. Oh, dear. Yes. Name. He's out there, yeah. is he? And what's this? What's his name here? This is the list of the, the, the Indians themselves in the ship. Yes. But he's not there, is he? Think we got yep. him? Yep. I think we have him. Ships from Calcutta. Aha. Now he must be here. No. Well, well, we're still yeah, 1855. Let's go to the front. It's the yeah. index. Yeah. Apolline. Apolline. Aha. 50. 50. Yeah, right. 50. Uh -huh, look at him. Look at him. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 like we traced him, right? God, yeah. look at him. Yes, there we did. That Look at him when he came. 14th of June, 1855. Yes. Mm -hmm. So 14th of June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tell you, nobody yeah. in my family has ever seen this, you know, mm. Evan, I'm grateful to you, right? Okay, his father's name father's here name. is P-U-R-R-O-W-T-Y. T-Y. Porot. Porot. Uh, yes. How was okay, that? Okay, male, male age that? 27. Oh, he was 27 when he yes. came? Well, he was 27 yes, years. he was 27. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, and here he died um, in oh, 1812. Dear. His his um, debt uh, certificate number is 479 of 1912. When he died? When he died in 1912. So what is that 479, 1912? That's um, the ID number. Yeah. So you'd have to go at the back and look for 479, 1912 and you'll find oh, so the death certificate. 
Because you always think you're going to find the old man. You never really believe he died. Because he's been such a memory, such a kind of a, a legend and a rumor in our minds. You, and until you see it says dead in very heavy, really sad, heavy, sad, dark writing. He ceases to be a legend and a rumor in your mind because he actually died in 1912. I never expected, this came as a shock to me, I never expected that I would also see his death. So that this has been very shocking, you know. And the bluntness of it, after all those years of pulley work, it just ends dead, 479. Where did that number come from? Was he the 479 yes. pulley to die? <laughs> For that particular period, probably. Really? Yes. Well, he chose an odd number. Huh? Oh, there he is. The year when, of the Titanic. Was the Titanic go down in 1912? The Titanic went down in 1912. <laughs> so when the Titanic was going down in 1912, this little pulley was also going down. Huh? While the Indian coolies continued to toil in the sugar plantations of South America and the West Indies, it was events on the other side of the world that would finally turn the tide against the whole system of indentured labor. News of Gandhi's campaign in South Africa had reached London, and the idea of an Indian uprising became a very real threat. The Indian problem was the obsession of one man, General Smuts, the Prime Minister of Natal. He demanded that his friends in Westminster rid Africa of what he called the Asiatic cancer that they had introduced. They began by enforcing an impossible tax on the Indians. I think the intention of the Natal government was to make the lives of the indentured workers hard. Um, if they were not going to pay this tax, then they would have to be perpetually indentured. If they were going to be free, um, they were never able to earn substantial amounts of money. It was an impossible tax, and it was meant to be an impossible tax. Gandhi didn't give up. He continued to hold protest meetings and invited Indian political leaders to come to South Africa and see how badly the empire treated its Indian citizens. In November 1913, Gandhi launched his biggest campaign to date. He began by addressing Natal's coal miners, persuading the indentured workers to come out in protest against the government. Soon over 15,000 indentured workers from the nearby sugar estates also joined the strike. 20,000 people responded to Gandhi's call. These are the only surviving photographs of that protest in 1913 and show Gandhi himself at the moment of his arrest. They also capture the birth of civil disobedience. Many of the protesters were brutally beaten and imprisoned by British officers, and Gandhi was sentenced to nine months in prison. Here was an Indian rising to prominence with a particular political message, directed ultimately, as we all know, at India itself, but speaking to the condition of Indians worldwide. And the condition worldwide was basically indentured labor. And it's at that point, and the kind of upheavals which followed Gandhi's message, that leads imperial figures to speak out against indentured labor itself. Even from within the establishment, unlikely voices were moved to announce that indenture could not be allowed to continue. One was Lord Harding, the Viceroy of India. Indians in South Africa have violated these laws with full knowledge of the penalties involved. In all this, they have the sympathies of India, deep and burning, and not only of India, but of those who, like myself, have feelings of sympathy for the people of this country. Whitehall was outraged. Increasingly frantic internal communications warned that Gandhi's coolies were becoming martyrs. The cabinet discussed Harding's immediate recall, but didn't want to agitate an already delicate situation. 
Indentured emigration was suspended pending further investigation as Britain entered the First World War. Who in 1914 could say that this system makes any sense in the world of the 20th century? It's, it's as antediluvian as slavery had once become in a century earlier. While Britain turned its attention to other more pressing matters, the man who had arrived in South Africa as a young middle-class lawyer was preparing to leave a completely changed man. We were all foolish. I was an insignificant, foolish lawyer. Take Gandhi, the lawyer, 1906 in a western suit, and take Gandhi on the eve of his departure from South Africa, dressed in very Indian traditional dress, but very simple rustic dress. In his dress in 1914, when he's leaving, he's signaling his identification with an indentured working class, that this is the identity that he wishes to be associated with. This is a Gandhi who has managed to find a mass following. And the nut shell of what is Gandhiism is very much in shape in 1914. And it's in India that he then begins to apply whatever he has learned in South Africa to a bigger project, the freedom of India. The British scattered a million and a half Indian people to all corners of the globe, with all kinds of consequences right down to the present day. If you consider many of the great political upheavals of the last 30 years in the old British Empire, the tensions in Fiji between Fijians and Indian peoples, the extraordinary expulsion by Amin of Asians from Uganda, the extraordinary demographic confusions of South Africa brought about by people settled there by the British. All of this a direct consequence of British imperial and economic policy in the world at large. The Indian coolies may have become a distant memory, but their legacy refuses to go away. Freed from indenture, they forged their own communities and abandoned colonies around the world, becoming lawyers, doctors, entrepreneurs. In countries from the Caribbean to the South Pacific, Indians formed the majority of the population, and in some took political power but they have now become victims of their own success. What started as a peaceful prayer meeting in central Serva turned into violence with the arrival of about 100 angry Fijians. Armed soldiers and police stood by as the Fijians went on the rampage. From the relative safety of the Serva travel lodge, journalists watched as Fijians beat Indians. In 1987, ethnic violence and rioting in Fiji led to a series of coups which ousted the Indian-dominated government. Today, ten rebel soldiers stormed inside the parliament building and marched them all off at gunpoint. The Prime Minister, Dr. Timothy Bavadra, along with the Deputy Prime Minister, one of 19 Indians dominating the government since last month's election in racially divided Fiji. Now, more than a century after they were first transported around the empire, the legacy of indentured labor has come back to haunt the Indians of Fiji. The new Fijian nationalist government is enforcing archaic British laws dating back to the period of indenture, laws which prohibit Indians from owning land. As land leases come up, they are not being renewed. Thousands are being displaced and impoverished. Stranded in refugee camps with no country willing to accept them, the cause of their plight, the British system of indentured labor, has been quietly forgotten by the rest of the world. If you look at all that and think of this as a kind of function of grand British imperial design, all designed for British betterment, for our well-being, 
but who so much knows about it now? Who so much thinks about it? There is an extraordinary uh, discrepancy between what the British did and what they remember they did. I hope to ensure that the hardship that they have endured, the difficulties that they have encountered in the long and hard journey from India to the plantations and from plantations to now is remembered by posterity. Okay, boys and girls, I will read to you one poem which I learned in class three. Raat Andheri Hawa Sansani Paal Phal Phadate Thay Upar Siriya Aage Badha Chala Tha Fiji Sagar Ki Chhati Par Ta Ek Ka Hua Dhada Ka Siriya Takra Chattano Se Ek Taraf Wa Siddhe Duba Machi Kulahal सब लोगों में डूब मरे मल्लाह यात्री समा गए सीरिया वाज द वर्स्ट डिजास्टर इन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ इंडियन इंडेंटेड एमिग्रेशन टू फिजी 57 पीपल डाइड एट नसलाई इन द इमेज ऑफ रैक resonates with the experience of my people today. So ladies and gentlemen. Place. Syria reminds me of history repeating itself. I have devoted most of my adult life trying to understand the experience of Indian people in Fiji. It's very emotional because I'm not talking about a group of people in the abstract. I'm talking about people from whom I am descended. I find it haunting. The ghosts of the past haunting the place reminding us of the sacrifices and the difficulties our people faced. Yes, by exposing the legacy of slavery and its lasting impact on other communities, this documentary film really challenges viewers to confront some uncomfortable truths and reflect on the enduring consequences. And I know some of you might be wondering, well, why we feature this now? This particular topic was selected because tomorrow, which is August 1st, Trinidad and Tobago observes Emancipation Day. 
It is the first independent country in the world to declare a national holiday to commemorate the abolition of African slavery, after which Indian indentureship came. So in this particular film, we were privileged to learn about the indentured past of the grandfather of the late but very esteemed historian Bridge Lal from Fiji, who unfortunately passed away on December 25th, 2021. And now it is my privilege and honor to bring you our first discussant. And this is none other than Professor David Davidi. He was born in Guyana, as you all just saw. He now lives in the UK. He's a novelist, poet and academic and an honorary fellow of Selwyn College at Cambridge University in England. He's also former ambassador to China and former ambassador to UNESCO. Dr. Dabedin was the co-narrator on this film. Sir, I welcome you. Please unmute. Mute, unmute. Yeah, I can hear there you I am. Now. Mm -hmm. Good. Am I on um, video as well? I'm not seeing you on video, but we're hearing you clearly. Let me see. Da, 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 da. I can't, I, I don't know what this, oh yeah, sorry. I forgot to put the camera up. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> um, what would you like me to say, um, Shalima? David, first of all, could you please, could you please just tell us whose idea was it to create this particular film? Um, well, I, I had a very good friend called, uh, I still have a very good friend called David Olasuga, who is now also an honorary patron of the Amina Gaffer Institute. And he and I had worked on, on other things on post-colonial matters. So we decided, um, I think we decided it'd be, nice, it'd be let's try to do a film on, on indentureship since it was brand new, uh, never been done on television before. So he he persuaded his BBC people, and and so we 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 um we we did it. Yeah, I went to Guyana and, and did the filming. And, well, I and as as a direct consequence of that, a, a wonderful woman called Bridget Wells, when the when the documentary was shown on BBC Two, uh, she saw it, and I was sitting in my office at the University of Warwick when a phone call came. Uh, this is Bridget Wells. Uh, uh, by the way, I, I saw your documentary, and I, I, I should say to you that my my great great uncle, my great great uncle, was the ship surgeon on the Hesperus, which was the first ship to arrive with the Whitby in Guyana in the fifth of April, fifth of May. And so she, I said, "Oh yes, oh she he was a ship surgeon," and then she said, "And he kept a diary. He kept a diary of the visit of the of the whole journey." Well, I nearly fell off my chair when she said, would you like to look at it? Would you like to look at it? I said, of course I would, right? So this is the very first writings on, on the ship journey, on, on indentureship, in terms of um, written from inside the ship by the ship's surgeon. His name was uh, Theophilus Richmond. So my wife and I went down to Lewis in the south of England to meet a Bridget Wells. And we met in a, in a, in a, in a bar a kind of a restaurant bar, and she produced the book, Green Leather Bound. And when you opened it, copper plate, handwriting by the doctor, Theophilus. And, you know, I had to wash my hands before, and, you know, and it was, it was, it was reverential. It was a reverential, and it was historic. <laughs> anyway, we published it um, with, um, we published it uh, yeah. a few years later. It was called, we published a book, it was called The First Crossing, The Diary of Theophilus Richmond, myself and the late Brinsley Samaru, my dear, dear pioneering brother, uh, Amar Wahab, Bridget Wells, and John Morley. And um, we published it with the Derek Walcott Press, because Derek Walcott visited Warwick quite a bit, and I said, can we, can we set up a press in your name, and can we publish this book? The first crossing, and he said yes because when if you do read his Nobel Prize speech, Derek Walcott begins his speech by talking about the performances of Ramlila on the plantation, and he ends his um his um, Nobel Prize speech by referring to the to that tradition of Indian performance and Indian music. So it was really pleasing that we were able to publish that book, The First Crossing, uh, with the Derek Walcott Press. 
and I and of course in the in, in the process of doing research for that book, I I didn't really realize it was eleven thousand miles of the journey, eleven thousand miles from Calcutta to Guyana. Uh, Theophilus Richmond set off in eighteen thirty seven uh, from Liverpool. And Liverpool was a slave port, and um, he was appointed by Sir John Gladstone, who had slave estates in Guyana. And of course, as you know, it was Gladstone who set up the whole system of indentureship. The first Indians being called Gladstone Coolies. On board that ship, going to Calcutta, stopping at Cape Verde and around the coast of uh, South South Africa and into Calcutta, was a black cabin boy, who was a servant, as it were, of um, Theophilus Richmond. Uh, and so, therefore, that was the very first time, possibly. Well, almost certainly the very first time that an African met an indentured laborer, because they all came back in the same boat, you know. And we do know as well that soon after the Indians arrived, uh, and because there were over 156 Indian men and a few, 156 or 150 Indian men and a few women and, and a few children, we do know that um, as, so, as soon as the boat had docked, as it were, relationship, uh, amorous relationships were formed between the Indian men and the African women. We know that because there are complications as to who will pay for the picnic, <laughs> who, who, will take up the, who will take up the costs for, uh, for, for, for the children. So that whole book was, um, was, was very exciting. And um, it, 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 two things about that ship journey, in case anybody's not read the, uh, the, the, the diary. One was how perilous it was, uh, because it, it got caught up in enormous storms. So at one stage, the uh, up to knee, knee height, there was flooding in, on the ship. But you can imagine the terror and the screaming and so on of Indians who had never, ever, ever uh, been at sea. Um, secondly, the outbreak of cholera. Um, Dr. Richmond was quite amazing in that he, there was a cholera outbreak and he, and he saved he saved most people on board by fumigation, by separation, and by rum. He gave everybody rum to drink, and, and it worked. Uh, and so when I launched this book in Guyana, um, De Demerara Distillers uh, hosted the launch. And obviously, uh, I was able to talk about rum as a therapy. Um, as a result of which I suppose Demerara still has sold a bit a few more bottles. So that was um that was um that came that book came about directly as a result of that film. But a, a few years before a, a year before that film came out, we we'd done a book on the very first novel written about indentured life in Guyana and the Caribbean by a, a writer who in 1877 published a novel called Lakshmi and Dilu. Uh, and, and, that, and that was the very first novel ever published on indentureship. Uh, what happened with uh, John Jenkins is that he, um, he was a reformer. He, he was really concerned about the plight of the poor. And he went to Guyana uh, in, I think, um, 1871, he went to Guyana uh, to do a report, which he the Abolition Society sent him there. And he did a report called The Cully, His Rights and Wrongs, which is more or less an indictment of the whole system. But that was not well read or received in England. So he thought he would write a novel instead because he was a really well-known and I should say a best-selling novelist. So a few years later, he published, he wrote his book, uh, Lakshmi and Dilu in 1877. So... All of these things were going on in the in the early two, uh, 2000, 2002, this film, 2003, the novel Lakshmi and Dilu, and then a few years later, the first crossing, the diary. Now I have to say, 20 years later, uh, when, when um, 20 years after we published Edward Jenkins' Lakshmi and Dilu, the first novel, as I said, on, on Indo-Caribbean life, 20 years later, Cambridge University, set up a five-year program of visiting fellowships in indentureship studies. And uh, I, I may have missed uh, Shobi in case she mentioned it, but last week, the inaugural lecture was given by Professor Bahadur, and it was historic because as Cambridge said, this is the very first time 
in British in world academia that indentureship is being hosted as being studied in terms of uh, in academia uh, in, a, in a systematic manner and of course the whole idea is to set up a permanent post a permanent professorship in indentureship in studies which is what I'm working at um, so it's history isn't it and getting the imprimatur of Cambridge University which is one of the top universities in the world it means the subject moves from the margins to the very center so nobody can say now why are you doing indentureship what's that about we say, look at Cambridge. <laughs> you know, indentureship is is the one of the major legacies of slavery. Yes, indeed. And I want to um, I want to thank you very much for sharing those insights and the tidbits that you did. Again, we want to congratulate you and the Amina Gafur Institute for taking the lead in establishing that visiting fellowship in indentureship studies at the University of Cambridge. Excellent work there. Thank you. We have a, we have a question from uh, Salva Naidu of the 1860 Heritage Center. This is South Africa. He's asking, has the state of the ship lists and archival documents been improved in Guyana? He wants to know if, for example, the emigration passes have been digitized for Guyana. My, <clears throat> my understanding is no. Uh, what, 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 um, what, what has happened is that all the ship records all of them, which were rotting away in the post office, rain and everything, as, as, was, as was shown, revealed in the film, they have now moved to a, a state-of-the-art archive, a new archive uh, built by the government um, called, named after Walter Rodney. So at least they are now housed um, in, in a safe location. Mm -hmm. Digitalization we are really behind that. I mean, I know that we talk about it all the time at the university and at the National uh, Ministry of Culture, and no doubt some of it has taken place. But I really, I've not had a chance to ascertain how far they've gone in that project. Yeah, so we were there a few years ago, possibly about maybe five years ago, and um, they've started, but it's very, very slow. And you are right, state-of-the-art facilities that you walk into, but no, the records are still in a poor state. So they have a lot of work to do. And I hope I, I'm so pleased that you were able to find your grandfather's records, uh, both his arrival as well as his passing. So yeah, congratulations it was, it was, to you. It was, it was my great grandfather. I remember when I found it, um, I, I was a bit, I was a bit take, not taken aback, I was a bit stilled because this legendary figure had suddenly become real. He died and everything. And I remember the cameraman hoping that in that pregnant pause, I would cry. <laughs> and there's no way I would cry on television. Um, plus they weren't paying me properly anyway. <laughs> um, and I, I have to confess, I'm not romantic at all about my antecedents in India. I go to India every year, sometimes twice a year. And when I go, I, I never look for the village. It's my, one of my friends said to me, David, if you're going to find your village, just choose the best one. Choose one with running water and electricity, latrines, right? <laughs> okay, well, we, have, we do have some people who have indeed gone back. They found their villages and um, they were a little romantic about it. So we'll have to share that sometime. Yeah, but I, I understand I add, what I, you're saying. Sorry, can I add one last thing very briefly? Um, the Amina Gafur Institute does not do genealogical research. We're not here to do family trees, we're scholars. We do history and literary studies and so on. I, we do get letters, including I think somebody on this uh, link wanting to know about their family histories. Unfortunately, we can't help as, a, as an institute, but we can certainly put you in touch with somebody in Guyana who may be able to help you. Yes, great. And of course, you can always connect them with us who will further connect them with the Gomitia Foundation, who is on the ground in India, operating Wonderful. out of an office in New Delhi and um, doing extremely good work there. So I'm not seeing any raised hands. Oh, David, Dr. David Subran. Okay. Dr. David Subran has a question for you. Go ahead, please, sir. Can you unmute? Is it unmuted now? Yes, you're audible. 
All right. I am the grandchild of indentured Indians, landed here in 1896. I agree that many were fooled and misled and with little understanding of what they were getting into. But there were also push factors from my research because there were many who were trying to escape hunger and starvation as well as oppression from the, the landowners and caste discrimination. Before we can dub the indenture system as another form of slavery, the research should have explored, you know, the condition of Indians who quickly moved from the estate barracks into modern houses, wooden houses, and then into modern homes. My ancestors bought four, bought four parcels of land before they died in Trinidad. This could not have happened while they were planting bhaji in India. The rate of social mobility has been enhanced in Trinidad I'm speaking of, because as third generations, most of my siblings and myself have had to attend university. We have had higher degrees. This could not have happened in India. I spent five months there and know what it is like. You see, there is no caste discrimination here. Uh -huh. I think that the, the film lacks balance. It dwells on the cons and forget the pros. And yeah, as I, such, I, yeah, I, as I, such I, we may call it propaganda. Yeah, well, History I, I, must I, take yes, note. Okay, Dr. Sabran, Dr. Sabran, yeah. thank um, you. I, Let's I, get I, a comment from Professor David. Yeah, I, no, I, 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 I think that, um, I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave soon, so I do forgive me. Um, I, I, um, I, 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 I def definitely don't believe that slavery uh, that the indentureship was a second form of slavery. It was miserable, it was horrible, we know all of that, but I, I agree completely. We were also fleeing from famine, from money lenders. Uh, when, when you're a Dalit or a low caste in India, the chances of owning land are very remote. So I agree with you that that film should be now remade in some other way. Uh, it, it was 2002, it was the first statement made. That is how the BBC sold it as a, as a new system of slavery. Uh, I, we didn't choose the title, <laughs> and, um, and we certainly didn't talk about slavery. I certainly didn't, comparing it to indentureship. Two different things. We, we had a re the possibility of a return passage. The, the African slaves didn't. Simple as that, right? Yeah. Uh, let me say how all of this started. In, in 1976, I went back to Guyana. I was at the University of Cambridge at the time. I was a student. I had to go back because there was illness in the family. And I saw such poverty in Guyana, people queuing up for right, people queuing up for even for sugar. You know, the government at the time had brought the country to the brink of, uh, to the brink of bankruptcy and malnutrition. And I was introduced to an old woman uh, who lived in a concrete kind of, well, hardly a shed really, without a, without a door and without a, a window. And she looked very uh, meager, uh, as we say in Guyana, maga. She looked um, malnourished. And she asked me what I was doing. I said I was studying in England. And she said to me proudly, I have a son studying at the University of Toronto. Isn't that amazing? And that is when I decided I have to use whatever resources I have. I was, I'm lucky I'm in England. I'm in England. I'm at a, one of the best universities. I have access to books and I got friends and so on. Let, let us, let, we must do something for that woman. So that's how all of this started. That's incredible. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Subran, I'm sorry that I may have cut you across. I just wanted everyone to know that Professor Dabidine has limited time with us, but we do have our second discussant, um, Mrs. Uma Mishri, waiting still to talk. So yeah, well, just before... Thank, well, mm -hmm, thank you very just... much. I mean, I'm, I'm not running away. I have at this very moment next door at my dining table, two Guyanese who've come from Guyana. So we're having, we're having a curry. And I can't leave them by themselves. So do forgive me. Yeah. 
I understand. So thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to bring on Mrs. Maestri now and we can take the rest of your questions and hopefully she'll be able to assist. Thank you so much, Professor Dabidine. Excellent as always. Wonderful you. of you to give us your time. Thank you very much. And, and lots of love to Uma. Good. <laughs> thank you. Welcome, Mrs. Maestri. You can go ahead and unmute. Let me properly introduce you, please. Dr. Uma Dophelia Maestri is a of South Africa. She's Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Western Cape. She's the author of A Chronicle of Indian South African Life. For those of you who do not know Dr. Uma, she's the great granddaughter of the legendary Mahatma Gandhi, and she's one of the people who was interviewed in the BBC documentary film that we just featured. So welcome, ma'am. You can go ahead now and uh, please share your comments about the film and your involvement in the film, and then we can take some questions for you. Please unmute. Hi, um, now it's, it's such a pleasure to have heard David Dabadine and how this whole pr uh, project started because um, I came in, uh, you know, without any background for, you know, how this started. I just now was contacted by Deep Sagal and uh, Sebastian Barfeld. Barfield, and they said they were producing a documentary on indenture, and they particularly wanted me to speak about Gandhi in South Africa. So at the state, at the time, um, it was around 2001, they came to South Africa. And at that time, I'd already published From Cane Fields to Freedom, and I was working on a book on my grandfather, Manilal Gandhi. And uh, what the two of them did was to take me to Durban, Peter Maritzburg and Johannesburg for three over three days. So um, it was to look at all the spots where Gandhi had been. So we went to uh, the point where he was almost assassinated when he got off the uh, ship and an angry white crowd, you know, attacked him and he almost uh, was killed at that particular scene. So we saw the point, um, seen, uh, you know, and then we went to Peter Maritzburg where he was kicked off the train. In fact, we took a train from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. And then from there, we actually went to Johannesburg where, um, you know, we first went to Phoenix Settlement in Durban where Gandhi's house was and where the indentured workers actually came for refuge during the 1913 strike. And then we went to Johannesburg where we uh, looked at the prison where Gandhi was imprisoned and where my own grandfather was put into the isolation cell. So, um, you know, that was, as, as you can see, was quite an emotional moment for me because I was writing his biography and I'd seen his description of him going to prison. And so it was, you know, the isolation cell was actually quite a shock to me. And I actually bawled out loud. It was a loud cry in, in that prison, you know. And so from what I'm telling you is that it's actually quite a um, an extended piece of footage, uh, you know, which is lying cut on the floors there, which were, wasn't used. Um, but what I got from Sebastian Barfield and Deep Cycle, they had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do. They almost um, wanted you to say particular things. And so, um, you know, they, I, they both of them were extremely well read about the whole system of indenture. And Hugh Tinker's book, The New System of Slavery, was actually their their basic text. In fact, the whole film, the whole idea of the new system of slavery came from Tinker's book. And so I found myself having to say some things that they wanted to say, wanted me to say, you know, and I think they're things that are missing, um, you know, that, uh, for instance, Henry Pollack's role in going to India, all that's kind of missing from there. Uh, but, uh, you know, the person I miss most or, you know, here is actually Bridge Lal. I didn't know David or Bridge Lal then, but today I know both of them and consider them both my brothers. Um, and so, um, you know, Bridge, um, when he was working on this book, Girmithias, he said, now, why don't you write an autobiographical essay 
almost like how you spoke on this documentary, you know, bring in your personal history and then put it into a personal essay. So I didn't quite listen to him because I didn't particularly, I mean, I wasn't so overthrilled about my own role in this uh, documentary. I was, I thought Bridge and David's stories was just so, so powerful, you know, um, so I did something else. But Bridge one day, and I hope he never, you know, I mean, he doesn't sway me from up there for revealing, you know, our discussions. But we talked, you know, I said, you know, you, David, and I were in this documentary together. And then he said, you know, I hope I'm just going to read out his email so that Bridge is part of our discussion here. Um, he said, I hope one day we will sit down and compare notes about the making of coolies. And, you know, actually, when I read this email and I've seen the documentary, I actually don't know why Bridge didn't like the way he was presented in the documentary. He says, I was hugely disappointed with the way they used my material, putting twists on it, which completely contradicted my views. That experience made me very cautious about documentaries. I had a similar experience that the government of India made about the relationship of overseas Indians to India. I spent hours being filmed. And in the end, when the editing was done, I could hardly recognize myself. For some reason, Bridge was not happy with how he came across here. And he felt, you know, that he says he's he completely contradicted his views. But actually, when watching this, I couldn't find that. You know, and but I know from my own personal experience, I did feel that uh, the producers had a very have heavy hand in wanting to shape this. And I agree with the previous with David Subran that you know it's twenty years since that documentary was made. It's many years since Tinker's book has been published, and there's been new work on indenture for South Africa. We've had Ashwin Desa and Gulam Vahid's excellent book on inside indenture. And what that does is to prioritize the voices of indentured workers and to prioritize agency. So yes, this was a terrible system, but within this system, indentured workers were able to make decisions, make choices, act in particular ways to be true to themselves. And of course, the point is that indenture um, you know, uh, there's some people who still insist that, yes, this was slavery, and it actually makes me very cross in South Africa when people insist, you know, we were like slaves. And as David says, you know, there's a difference between indenture and slavery, and we mustn't underplay what slavery is by comparing indenture to that and saying it's the same thing. It's not the same thing at all. In South Africa, we've had you know, 100 years or more of slavery, several centuries of slavery in the Cape Colony. And it is nothing, indenture is nothing like that, you know. And so um, I agree with that particular point. And I think in looking at indenture today, um, you know, it's the, it's the, to emphasize the opportunities, as David Subrin says, there is the other side. People became extremely, some people became extremely wealthy. We have very good examples of that in Natal. So maybe I should just leave it there and let questions come, um, you know, around. But I think, you know, also the search for documentation, that has not ceased, you know. If David was looking 20 years ago, people are looking today. They're looking for records, they're looking for photographs. And, uh, you know, so it, that search for, the ancestors has become even more urgent today. Yes, it's true. I agree with you. And at this point in time, I want to bring on Mr. Evan Passad, who we had the pleasure of meeting some years ago at a Guyana Historical Society um, conference. Mr. Passad was actually featured in the film just now, and he's reminding us in the chat that he's the one who located the volume containing the information about Professor Dabedin's ancestor. So Mr. Passad, go ahead and unmute, please. Let's hear from you about those records in Guyana. Can you unmute your mic? Uh, I think I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, you're audible. Uh, Welcome. Okay. Namaskar, Salaam Alaikum, good afternoon, or good day, or whatever time it is around the world. Um, 
Yeah, so, so this is the first time I've appeared on this program. Um, so those many years ago, you know, David um, was my schoolmate in primary school. He was two years ahead of me. Uh, two of his sisters were in my class. And um, I had returned from Canada in 1996. And uh, immediately I had spent like four months in the uh, registry looking for ancestors. And uh, then I, I moved over to the National Archives. So by the time David came to do the documentary, um, you know, I, I knew how to move about both in the registry and the archives to find information. So uh, finding his ancestors was very, very easy. It was done very quickly in a matter of minutes. Um, we, at that time, the Ap Apolline, the ship that his uh, great, great or great grandfather came on, came twice. So first we checked in 1853 and his name was not in there. So we went across to 1855 and we found it virtually immediately. Um, the records, um, those ship records have been moved from that building um, that you see in the, in the video to um, a newer air-conditioned uh, National Archives of Guyana, which is called the Walter Rodney Building. So they're better preserved over there. And um, I, I have spent four years on the board of the National Archives of Guyana between 2012 to uh, end of 2015. Uh, and um, I've done quite a bit of research. Um, I have maybe three or four you know, stuff ready for publication. And uh, the one I'm working on right now is the 1838 arrivals, the very first two ships, the Whitby and the Hesperus. Uh, I probably have a, another month of work to find out exactly what happened to those 420 people who landed here alive, if they went back to India, if they died during their indentureship, or if they died subsequently, you know, in British Guyana. So work is going on. Um, uh, I'm glad to say that the, uh, the records are now um, in, a, in a better place than, than you see in the, uh, you know, David was very uh, distraught actually when he came upon the records in 2002 um, because he felt that they would not last in there because it was, uh, we are on the third floor of that building and you had the salt air of the Atlantic Ocean feeding into that place every day. Um, and you know, um, with heat and um, humidity, uh, records could be quite easily destroyed. So I'm glad to say that um, those records are now in a much safer area. And thank you for having me on for a few comments. Well, thank you for being here and thank you for being instrumental in some way in assisting with those records and updating us as well. Yes, we anytime. It. Okay, thank you. We have, uh, I'm seeing Ranbir with his hand up. Ranbir, would you like to ask a question? Uh, you try to unmute, but you're muted again. Could you please unmute? You are now, you're audible now. I'm, Ranbir, I'm sorry, you're, you are unmuted, but we are not hearing you. We're not hearing you. You are unmuted, but we're not hearing you. There may be an issue with the mic on your device. I'm sorry, your mic is not connected. I'm so sorry. Let's take a um, question or comment from Mr. Satya Dutt. Please unmute. Yeah, I'm here. Namaste. Uh, this is Satya Datta from New Zealand, and um, I'm born in Fiji. And um, I'm overwhelmed to see that uh, in this uh, film, there has been a lot of coverage from Fiji, especially Professor Bridgelan, the work that he has done, the historian, our hero boy from Fiji. That's lots of contribution that he has from there. And I would uh, like to compliment the uh, um, people who have worked uh, very hard to produce this uh, uh, film, especially endorsing all those things which uh, happened uh, to the Fiji Indians, the Grimitias, 
descendants in terms of the political turmoils we went through. I have personally gone through all those um, turmoils uh, since 1987, the first coup, and 2000 coup, and all those uh, um, lootings and everything which happened. Uh, that has actually made me decide to migrate to New Zealand, where I have been living there for the last 23 years and pursuing my profession of teaching. And I am very overwhelmed to be part of this. And I'm also a member of uh, Fiji Grimit Global uh, Institute. And you would know Dr. Uh, Ganeshan, who is um, heading uh, this um, Grimit Global. And recently we had our uh, conference in Fiji. Uh, I mean, uh, and uh, it was so great to meet so many of the people from Grimitia countries. And uh, uh, I will be always part and parcel of this. And thank you very much for the opportunity that I had this morning. And in about five minutes time, I'll be back to the classroom. And over here in uh, New Zealand, we have uh, uh, Cook Island Language Week celebration going on for the whole week. And similarly, we celebrate uh, uh, Hindi Language Week for whole week around Diwali celebration so that, you know, our diverse community over here can connect to our Hindi, to our culture, to our people. And aap sabhi ko namaskar. Aur mai bahut prasand ho ki aaj mujhe samokha mila aap sabhi se jurne ke liye. Our, and I will always be in touch. And I will put my address and my email over there so that we can all be connected. Our Hamjuteri Sitara. Absaviko Namaskar. Namaskar. And thank you so much for sharing and for being here with us. Thank you. That's, you're welcome. Let's move on now to Ranbir. Let's try again and see whether or not you can unmute. Can you hear me now, Shani? You are quite audible. Go ahead, please. Fantastic. Thank you. I apologize. For that. Well, thank you so much for the invite tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, as you know, I've been in contact over the Indo Caribbean exhibition at the Doctrine's Museum in London, which um, it's small, but you know what? It's a start. Um, I think it's important that this thing about indentured labor, okay, it wasn't slavery, but it was a type of servitude of some sort. It was type of forced labor. Yeah. Um, things like, for example, pegging acts in South Africa, they did not put in on the same level as whites. OK, this is what's not known about. They may have great opportunities. Also, this was a time when there wasn't even equality within Britain. Women didn't have the vote. Working classes barely got it towards the end of the 19th century. So when we discuss things like caste system, look, I'm not denying it exists or there are problems now in India, but that wasn't necessarily a push factor from India itself because of caste. Yes, there was destitution and there was poverty. There always had been. Um, but a lot of it was due to the economic system that Britain put in when they stopped planting rice and forced cash crops such as indigo, causing 10 million deaths from famine. And 10 million in those days was quite a large number. I mean, they had deaths about a million island from potato crop getting fungus. So it wasn't just India was happening. And loads of Irish went... To America took over New York police force in Boston. I mean, that's how it, how it happened. The reason I'm mentioning it is we have to put this all in context. Whenever the issue of indentured labor comes up, it's always like, well, India's got the caste system. Yes, but then it, it has, but it's not the way it, it's portrayed. I mean, Brahmins are in poverty, doing, doing menial jobs. It's, it, it's a different, it's more of a class thing. Yeah, it, it's a bit, you know, kind of different. And I'm not denying the opportunity that took place. In fact, especially South Africa, a lot of um, Indians did well under apartheid despite apartheid, yeah? Many in Trinidad and other places got ahead despite the system. So, I mean, yeah, let's look at the brutalities and I don't deny, let's celebrate the, the success stories as well. Um, but above all, look, I'm not here for, necessarily for a blame game against the British Empire, it doesn't exist. I'm here for awareness. Just as with the contribution of Indo-Caribbeans and other uh, colonials, to the British war effort and two world wars is often not known about. The same is not known about the 
indentured labor as much. Their view is a slave is abolished, that's it, everyone's free. It's not how it was. It wasn't even how it was in Britain. Um, so it, it's important to, to a great awareness here. Um, UK, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, wherever communities are settled. And in the areas where there's any communities that exist in South Africa, Trinidad and Tobago, Ghana, it's not really known about as much. Um, but hopefully through organizations like in the Caribbean and through my own organization, Hindu Human Rights Group, we, we can push it. Um, sorry I've said too much, but it's something that I feel <laughs> really important that isn't discussed enough and not widely known about. So, okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Randir. Uh, we featured the um, exhibition at the museum last week, as mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I want to thank you for your comments. I know that the film would have you know, illustrate some emotions and I've seen people. it many times. I've seen it. Many, it's a brilliant. It's a brilliant documentary. Yes. I post yes. a lot on social media. So, yeah, thank you. So let me bring on again, Dr. Uma Mishri, to comment. Please unmute. Uh, from the chat, I saw a few comments. Uh, you know, um, Selvin's mentioned a new book by Madhavi Kale on the Caribbean and uh, how she argues that, you know, you don't have to go for the two extremes. Yes, this was like slavery and no, this was not like slavery. That in, there's probably a, a middle truth where it encompasses a bit of both. And I think that that is a reasonable assumption. Um, there was another comment on the chat about how the system of indenture ended. And I think really it is true that the documentary doesn't quite enter into that. So for instance, it jumps to the 1913 strike, but it doesn't mention that already a few years before indentured labor to Natal was terminated in 1911. And this was because of a, you know, a really big fight put up by Gandhi Henry Pollack, who went and toured in India in 1909 and then pressed upon the Indian public. It doesn't also engage in why the Indian elites took up the whole case of indenture. You know, why did they want to end indenture? Now, in South Africa, it was, you know, the argument was that if you continue to treat free Indians badly, you cannot expect Indians. Uh, India to supply, constantly supply you with indentured labor, you know, so if you want to treat Indians well, then you can have indentured labor. So there was that one argument, but then there's the other argument by Gandhi also, that this whole system is inherently terrible. It is not good for the uh, well-being of the Indian women, it's not good for the men, um, and it, it casts a whole aspersion on Indians as a group you know, if to have workers in such situations. So these are the kind of arguments that actually don't come across well on the in the documentary. And then we don't even have a mention that as of 1917, the whole system, you know, they, they were just, from 1917, they were, you know, that the shipping of an indentured laborers was to be stopped right across the, um, uh, all the British colonies. So there is that unfinished, story of the ending of indentured labor. Um, yeah, so I think that's about all I wanted to say. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, perhaps um, it's time for a discussion about part two or a new film to discuss what has left, uh, what is still left to be, or what is left unsaid. So that's something that um, perhaps you and Professor Dabi Dean can discuss in conjunction with others. I want to thank you so much for sharing all that you have and of course for always being here with us. We appreciate thank your you time. Much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I want to thank all the members of the audience as well for commenting, for adding to the discussion as well. And uh, most significantly, thank you so much to our speakers, Professor David Dabidin, Dr. Uma Mestri, for their time, their sacrifice and their efforts, and of course, being available to us today. Thank you so much to all of you, both on Zoom and on YouTube, for attending. I hope um, this was a very enlightening 
uh, discussion today. And you can always get access to the recording on our YouTube channel. I'm Shalama Mohammed, and I'll now bring on Shobi, who will formally close today's program. Thank you so much for being with us. Shobi, you're muted. Can you unmute? Robin, can you please unmute Shobi? Okay. Now it is unmuted. One moment. Thank you, Shalama, for being a great moderator as always. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to attend and participate. As was said earlier, this is a public meeting and is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Centre and the Amina Gafur Institute for the Study of Indentureship and its Legacies, which is led by Professor David Dabadeen. Please feel free to contact the ICC to publish your books and reports. Remember that we are asking you kindly to give us your suggestions as well as a donation. Please contact Dr. Mahabir for details. Thanks to the advisory and planning team led by Dr. Kumar Mahabir. Thanks to our IT manager who has been working behind the scene, Ravin Ram Singh, who has been recording the program and will upload it to our website and to our YouTube permanently for posterity. Our topic next week, Sunday, will be Asian Indians in East Africa. Please visit our YouTube channel to see all our past recordings. I am Shobi Ali from London, saying goodbye, God bless to you all. Danyavad. You're welcome, everyone. We really appreciate you all having been here with us. And um, I really hope that the film would have inspired some of you all to not only remember your ancestors, but to think about how we can actively bring them into focus so that we ensure that we don't end up in the situation that Sufa did based on the film. So I encourage you all to look at the recording and um, perhaps look at the film in its entirety again. Share it with others too. It's good information. The recording should stop uh, shortly. So we wish you all a great week. <laughs>